Hey, Rod. What's happening? I want to talk about the magic of the Scrum Project Management process. Mm, just it makes me warm when you talk about Scrum. You know? Yeah. For those who don't know, it's a um, project man- man- management management methodology that uh, a lot of software engineers use. Really, a lot of people use. And it is just money. Yeah. Like, cranking out efficiency, monitoring your process, daily checking in to make sure... That we're on the same weekly page. scheduling, you know, efficiency optimization, corporate speak, corporate speak. I'm not a huge fan of fanboying, but I'm a Scrum fanboy. Yeah. So interesting though, mm-hmm. Scrum. Not everybody's a fan of it. No. Why? Well, I read some articles recently that uh, some employees, especially I will say older employees, feel that. So this is an article talking about Silicon Valley, mm-hmm. and they felt that Scrum was a way for Silicon Valley to weed out older employees, mm. uh, which is interesting because the guy who came up with it is an ex-Air Force pilot. He's an older guy himself, mm-hmm. um, and he used uh, a an, was it UDA, uh, Observe. I don't even remember the mm-hmm. whole. Uh, but I guess it's, it's like any great thing comes great responsibility. Mm. Peter Parker, because <laughs> Scrum is pretty awesome, and yeah, I don't know. How but that, you but use just because it. it's awesome doesn't mean it can't have it. A can't negative have effect. a negative impact I, I depending would, on how it's implemented and utilized. I'd right? have to see the numbers. Like, does it really yeah. weed out? I don't know. Old. I don't. I would imagine it, it inherently. What are we calling old? No. Yeah, and is it inherent to the process, or is it just the people that are implementing the process? Oh, Ooh. moral questions. Moral. Welcome to, or welcome back to, More In Common. This is our social experiment. See, everyone has a story that can help us learn from one another. And we bring people into this safe space that we have learned to create so we can learn about their stories and get into difficult topics that challenge us in conversation and ultimately how we think. And we have a lot of these conversations. And we're seeing a lot of similar threads through all of them. So what we're doing is breaking down these conversations to create a set of tools and a map that will help you become a conversation boss so that you can be a catalyst for conversation in your day-to-day life. All right, so Keith, we just broke that down. Who do we have today? We have Jeff Tippett. Um, Jeff is known by audiences and fans as Mr. Persuasion. Uh, He is a subject matter expert in persuasive communications. He helps people increase their effectiveness, gives them powerful tools for attaining goals and dreams, and helps them positively impact their organization, all as they learn techniques for communicating persuasively with others. Um, When results mattered most, renowned brands like Airbnb, the National Restaurant Association, the League of Women Voters, the League of Conservation have trusted Jeff to develop and implement communications plans to persuade elected officials, the media, and the general public. And as an expert on persuasive communication, Jeff continues to deliver results for influential clients. Um, He has impacted thousands of lives through over 500 presentations, including keynotes and seminars, and other features Jeff's uh, expertise in persuasive communications through articles, podcasts, and blogs. Um, His second book, Unleashing Your Superpower, Why Persuasive Communications is the Only Force You Will Ever Need, landed um, in Amazon's number one international bestseller in multiple categories. I definitely recommend the read, and it's the reason he's with us today. So, uh, Roddy, what did we get into? Authenticity and what it means to Jeff, how he worked through being abused as a young uh, young man or an adolescent and and how he moved into embracing himself uh, growing up in general and um, having a drill sergeant like dad and how that's led to his perspective now and, and quite a few other things uh, including an adoption of one of their children so really really good conversation I, I would say one of my observations about this and I'm going to open the hood a little, here a little bit Keith uh, when Jeff reached out to us via LinkedIn, to, to me specifically, and we were looking into what he does, and we we're like, eh, we don't know, like, 
we're about conversation and connection. Persuasion feels a little forced. Like, ah, and and we, you and I, we had that conversation back and forth, and we weren't sure. And then we talked to him, and we were like, yeah, we're gonna go, green light. We're gonna do it, but we're still not sure. Then we had the conversation. We're like, okay, Jeff's a real deal. Like, he gets that persuasion. Like, to to get somebody to to even consider your point of view, you have to listen to them. And it's just money. It's it's a really good conversation. His book is good. Well, Keith says his book is good. I can't say that. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> um, what what conversation tips do you have? Yeah, I mean, I'm you know, it's it's. I want to. A lot of this conversation is really conversation tips, right? Um, when we talk about persuasion specifically, yes, there is that uh, direction to it from Jeff's perspective, but there's a lot, there's a good overlap in the things that we talk about. And I specifically love the dialogue of ex- accepting people where they are. Um, and you know, it, it's one of those, those pieces that's really important for, for our guidance and everything that we talk about. And Jeff, you know, does a great job in breaking it down and, and discussing that. So, um, you know, just listen to him and, 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 there's a lot of that, so I'm gonna I'm gonna not not do too much here up front. So um, just enjoy the show. It's a great conversation as always, and uh, you know, have fun. change I can make then is I can be loving to my kids. You know, I can hug them. I can kiss them. I can tell them I love them. I can tell them great job. I can be supportive of them and help them, you know, direct them as they're finding their, like, their careers. That's where my kids are right now and helping them find what's inside of them and help them be the, the very best you. And uh, so I can just change for myself now. I look for two magical words. If I'm having a contract negotiation for my, my company or for speaking, to know if I'm manipulated or I persuaded. And these two magic words will always tell you the difference. And those two magic words are, that's right. Today, we are with Jeff Tippett. Jeff, how are you today? I'm fantastic, guys. How are you doing? Oh, wonderful. Um, so, wanted to, wanted to ask this question um, after, after digging into your profile a little bit. Um, you've built this mission on persuasive communication. And I found this article on your website, uh, jefftippett.com. Um, one of the authors talks about building trust. Uh, and she mentions that a key function of that is authenticity. And, you know, in, in the preamble to this conversation, you've mentioned it, mentioned it a few times. And this is something that's very interesting to Rodney and I right now. Um, it's a fairly abstract concept. Uh, it's something that we talk about often and don't really dig into the meat of what it actually means. What does it mean from your perspective to be authentic? So to me, it's mostly about my willingness to to be true to who I am, um, to live out who I am as a human being, and to be open with that, to to be free of these concerns of judgments from other people coming in that would, would hold me back. And it's it's also, um, for me at least, it's a, it's also involves me letting go of childhood events and childhood things that have happened that may have caused me to constrain and to pull in and to hide. You know, for example, one of the like the childhood secrets that I carried throughout most of my adult life that I didn't even realize how much it was damaging relationships around me um, was the fact that uh, in a, as an early teen, um, I was sexually abused by a pastor. And so through that event, like I not 
knowingly, I mean, not knowing this, I built all these shells and I built these walls around me. And the thing was, I only knew that as normal. Like that was the norm uh, mm -hmm. to me. But what happened uh, because of that, like I have walls and I wouldn't allow people in, staff people, friends, people close to me. And, and people kept referring to me as you know, like things like aloof, like, like Jeff is here, but he's not really here. And it was only as I was willing to face that and accept that and say, yeah, you know, it happened, but it doesn't define me today. It doesn't define who I am. I can be free to talk about it. I can let it go, let it go out there. And as a result, it frees me up just to be more open about things in my life that, you know, I don't feel like I have to hide or, or live in shame any longer. Thank you for, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, you're actually the second guest now that shared it that exact same story from their life. Well, not the exact same story, but um, the story of abuse in their life. And in your case, how did you, like you came, you shared that very freely and openly and you seem very comfortable with it at this point where you are in your life. How did you, like, what did that take for you to work through that? A therapist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I'm sure. laughs> it took guided discussions like, to help me understand, especially happening so young and not understanding did I cause it was this something that I did um, you know what was my role in this and how does that mark me as an adult like all of these things all these like stigmas that are out there uh, as well um, and so it, it took it took time with a therapist just to kind of and it took a second therapist I remember going into the very first therapist and I just couldn't do it like I couldn't talk about it mm -hmm. and I you know I, I avoided it and, and I walked out and said hey I'll make an appointment later and I never made a follow-up appointment so it took us a, a second run at therapy for me to really begin to get in and to understand and it's so freeing now to, to be able to say, yeah, you know, it, it happened, but those shells are gone, man. That's like, yeah. oh, that's, that's cracked. It's over. Like, it yeah. doesn't matter. I'm not going to allow that to hinder relationships today and people that I, with whom I want to be close. It's um, one of those things that when we talk about mental health in the program, um, this idea of coming through in the other side, and we talk a lot about seeing a therapist, but one thing that we try to anchor on as well is the length of time it took you to get to that point, because you talk about being true to who you are, uncovering that as well as addressing you know, childhood abuse, like at what point did, how long did it take you to get to a point of realization or just that as, as much as you walked away from that first appointment, you still made it right. So that's a huge step. And then how long did it take you to work through that? Um, you know, to, to ultimately figure out who your true self is. So I think I was dealing with, um, well, the short answer is it's about a year in therapy before I like the light bulbs just kind of went off and I'm like, oh geez, I am kind of free from this. I don't like I don't feel like these walls, you know, around me. And you know, it's a combination. Like I, I worked through that, but also growing up with a father who was unable to say I love you or unable to say you did a really good job. You know, that was that was great work. Like I found, and you know, as I can explain in the story of the Haitian adoption, what I found out about myself was I was seeking approval from other people so much that my identity began to be wrapped around accomplishing things and making things happen. And it didn't matter if I was twisting arms or damaging relationships. Nothing mattered because what was priority to me was getting approval from someone else to come in and say, yeah, Jeff, you did a really good job in that. And once I was willing to let go of that idea, identity, you know, I could find that my essence is actually the opposite of that. It's just really coming alongside of people and helping them become the best version of them. What did you do? What was that work? What did it look like to, to not only get through reconciling that, but working through the need for approval and working through the uh, misidentity that you had towards yourself that ultimately brought you to a place of, of, of confidence in, in self-love, quite frankly. I think a big part of it for me was letting go of the past and not letting the past dominate my thought process today um, and, and realize that I am who I am today because of the decisions that I'm making, the choices that I'm making, the person that I want to be. And, and there's nothing, there's no reason to allow those things from the past to keep 
you know, controlling me today and this desire to be in control myself like, and not to allow others or allow these situations to define who I am, but just to really live because I am full of passion. I'm full of energy. Like, I'm full of zeal. Like that's just like who I am at my core. And I wanted to be there. Like I had this desire to be the best me um, that I could be. Is there any tool or exercise you use? I think earlier you mentioned you meditate in the mornings. Anything that you use to help you center on yourself or center on that or get to that those realizations? Um, meditation is huge uh, for me. It's a big part of my day. I start every morning. Second thing I do, first thing is to grab coffee. Uh, and then the <laughs> second thing is is to meditate. Um, um, reading, you know, as well. And, and I do a lot there, especially around Buddhism and, and those type teachings has been very influential in my life right now, especially of, of letting go of the past, living in the moment and you know, just letting things be. I think there's, there's something in that idea of meditation that um, is, is often not part of the, the dialogue because when you're working on something, you're working on it, you hope to get through it and then everything's set and solid going forward. But the reality is you've worked on it. You've gone through certain phases and we just talked to our coach about this, like going through increments. And now you're at another increment where you want to spend 15, you know, 30 days on this 15 minute meditation to change the way you think about something else and continue to evolve and improve. And, and, uh, I think that's awesome. And I have to ask what, what is that, that thought process that you're trying to rewire your thought process on? So I, I am mapping out a future that will provide the financial resources that I want and that I desire um, in such a way that is not strained, it's not extreme effort, um, that it is something that just flows in my life and this mindset of abundance that the universe has out there uh, for us as we, as we just set our heart, we set our intentions and do the things that we want to do. But for me, part of this now too is like, how do I do this without killing myself mm -hmm. and, and working all the time? Like, how, how do I accept that, that money? Money flows in very fun and creative ways uh, to me, and, and changing changing the mapping because you know I come from an raised from a, a, a dictator type father. And it was like how hard you were, harder, 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 harder. And um, but I don't think that life has to be that way. I want to be able to to work hard and do the things that I want to do, but I also want to have the time to enjoy life and the, live the life the way that I want to live it through traveling and hanging out with my kids and you know, being a dad, being a spouse, the things that are extremely important to me. So uh, I guess it's kind of that I want my cake and I want to eat it too, but I, I want to do it in a different way than has been uh, my background. So I feel like I have to remap myself um, to, ex to, to believe that I can have time for all the things um, that are important to me. It's a remapping um, that I too, and probably Rodney is going through as oh, well. Oh, absolutely. Now we have a kind of a fork because I'd love to dig into that a little bit. But I also want to ask, you've, you've mentioned your dad twice. Um, where did you grow up? Um, where did where did life begin for you, Jeff? So I grew up in a little town on the coast of North Carolina called New Bern, which was the original capital of uh, North Carolina, but probably better known as the birthplace of Pepsi. So the soft drink Pepsi was founded and birthed uh, in New Bern, North Carolina, which is my hometown. And um, how long did you li live in New Bern then? So I all the way up through high school uh, okay. and then so you know, went off to college. Where'd you go to college? I went to East Carolina University to graduate and undergraduate school. Yeah. Yeah. Fun time there. Um, I'm, I have a question. Like, so you, you know, Keith mentioned, you mentioned your dad. How would you characterize your childhood? And I'll qualify that a little bit by saying a lot of the work you've talked about, you've, you've gone through, I'm going through. And I started looking at it and like, oh, I'm like, I'm mad at my family and my parents, like how I grew up. Because I have these mindsets and, I, and then I thought about it, uh, kind of taking a further step back where we are culturally, like these are the things you have to do to make money. And these it's like, wait a second, like, it looks like there's a box, but there's not really a box. So I don't really have to be mad at my parents or any other things in my personal um, background. But I'm just curious because I'm just curious how you would characterize yours looking back. So as a kid, I. I ADHD, full of energy, boundless, like I was outside running, I was building forts, 
Um, I was an entrepreneur at one point. I started what I called Snoopy's Yard Club. So I would knock on doors and get gigs to mow grass and to rake leaves. But then I'd take it a next step further. and I'd hire my friends to go do the work, which allowed me to go knock on the next door. So that was that was my childhood. You know, the thing is, like, like during that period of time, I, I didn't know anything different. Um, yeah. you, know, you mentioned that that earlier was, with like the, that the was the story. norm. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's what. So like like when that. When I got married, um, the first time, um, my wife at, at that time, like her family was very loving and touching and hugging, and they would kiss each other and stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, what are you doing? Why do you want to <laughs> hug me? Uh, no, this is my space. Stay away. Like, cause that's, that's all that I, I knew. Um, and then, like, when I began to see other things, that, you know, I was also raised in a very religious home, like extreme um, religion as well, and um, a very non tolerant background. Um, so, you know, when I kind of came, th- I, I think to answer your question, I went through phases. So as a kid, it was, it was the only thing that I knew, but I was very happy. I was never a sad kid, I was extremely happy. And then I get out, and I'm like, oh my gosh, there were some little oddities about how I was raised that, that, that may not be exactly normal. And then I kind of went through this phase of like being angry, like, you know, why? You know, like, but then part of this through therapy as well, just kind of moving through to accept, you know, I feel like my father did the very best he could with what he knew, according to how he was raised and the education and where he was in life. I, I don't believe that, that he was, you know, he wasn't maliciously trying. No, he, that was all. That was the best that he could do. So you know, when I accept that, that's very freeing as well. And you know, except the fact like, that's still the it's the it's the past. You know, we can debate whether it's what's real and what's my perception. And you know, we can you know, go all around and around. And yeah, that's yeah. that part of it. But it, the change I can make then is I can be loving to my kids. You know, I can hug them, I can kiss them, I can tell them I love them, I can tell them great job, I can be supportive of them and help them. You know, direct them as they're finding their, like their career. Years. That's where my kids are right now, and helping them find what's inside of them, and help them be the, the very best you. And um, so I can just change for myself now. You you said religious house. I grew up in a pretty religious household as well. Um, you said non tolerant. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? Wow. So everything was a sin growing up. Like we could do <laughs> nothing growing up. Everything was a sin. Oh, and here's the next level. It wasn't just a sin. It was going to send you to hell. Like that is everything. I was so afraid. <laughs> so we afraid. couldn't even we couldn't even go to the movies. Like that was it was a sin to go to the movies. I was 16 when I went on my first date to the movies. I couldn't even watch the movie. I was so afraid if something happened, I was gonna die and go to hell because I was in a theater. Like that's the type of stuff that I grew up with. So uh, it, it's it's a wonder that I'm not more crazy than I am. But there's been a lot of this stuff to kind of you know, to have to work through it and to become more tolerant uh, of people. What uh, What's your <laughs> relationship to religion today? I mean, you went through some pretty, you know, traumatic experiences through the church and then you had this, you know, family lifestyle. Like, how do you raise your, or how have you raised your kids with it, you know, as your kids are getting older? So for me, um, I am still active to a degree um, with with faith and with religion. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in music and English, so I'm a classically trained pianist. Um, oh, wow. And on the, on the weekends, um, I help a startup United Methodist Church in downtown Raleigh. Um, and the reason that I'm that I'm willing to be there and willing to help us. I love music and I love being able to be creative you know, through expressing um, music. But this church, from its onset, you know, it was an older church that kind of fell apart. The bishop appointed a new pastor. Now it's been you know, restarted, you know, reignited um, a year ago this, this time. Um, but the church set forth up front that it was going to be a diverse congregation, that it wanted to welcome people of different backgrounds, that it was going to be an inclusive congregation uh, where gay, straights, whatever could come. And at the same time, there were going to be have a social justice bent as well, which means that the church was going to be very committed to things that are important to this community uh, and making sure that we could come alongside of people who whose voices may not be fully there uh, and to help and to stand up for things of that nature. So those are things that I can believe in and be part of. That relationship that you found with the church that you go to that is really focused on the community and really focused on all the things that it is. Is that part of what led you? So you adopted your daughter from Haiti. Is that what led you to do that? Like, I want to kind of go in that direction because, you know, given your background and, you know, how you grew up, 
and all of the work you had to do and you decided to go spend six months in Haiti to adopt a adopt a, a child right like how did that come about well i wish i could say that i fulfilled a lifelong dream of adopting a baby uh, and that you know here i am this big hero it, it's not the case um i had never thought about ever given any thought at all to adoption um i had your typical family I mean, life was just normal you know i was I had two kids um a son and a daughter at that time life was just very normal i was entrepreneur i had started a, a nonprofit, new nonprofit around that time uh, and my father went to haiti to do some humanitarian relief and he came back and um, asked him to meet and i wish i could say i uh, I sound like a horrible person now, but I wish I could say that I was excited to hear about his trip and you know what all he good he did there. But he was he picked one of my favorite restaurants, and I was excited about the menu. <laughs> and so I was like, "Yeah, Dad, I'm there. I'll go." Hey, um, sometimes so he, you just have to know your audience to get them in the room, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> it, it worked. So he came back, um, and we he he brought like old school photos, like hard copy photos, uh, and started telling me about his story. Um, and he got to this one picture, and. This one moment changed my life forever. He started telling me the story of his translator that he had built a relationship with. And this translator was a ninth grader who was in an English speaking Christian school and she happened to get pregnant. And the school gave her a choice. They said, either get rid of your baby or drop out of school. I, I can't even imagine making that gut-wrenching decision like how do you decide between taking care of yourself to make sure you can have a future and that you can have your know, life and then this baby that you have how, how do you even do that but you should sure process they said the that. same thing to the guy that got her pregnant yeah right <laughs> right Hell yeah yeah <laughs> yeah he's not even in the conversation yeah, yeah. um but so she made the decision that she wanted to um, give up her baby for adoption and guys i don't know what happened i looked at this picture She's holding the baby. The baby was naked, no clothes, holding the baby. And I just looked at the baby's eyes, and inside I knew that I was to adopt this baby. Like, this was my next step in life. This is what I was to do next was to uh, adopt this baby. Being that this process is, is so pivotal to where you are, like, how did – tell us about it. Talk, talk through it, you know. You know, give give maybe some details that that you you don't necessarily have the space to give in most online posts of your bio. Yeah. So what I knew was that I was to take this step. Like I knew that I was to adopt this baby. What I didn't know what was what was going on in Haiti at the time. President Aristide was being run out of office. So you had his his supporters and his detractors. And there was major civil unrest going on in Haiti. So I committed, emotionally committed in, like, I'm in. Like, I bought in without even understanding uh, what was going on. Um, but it was the first time in my life that I had had a gun pointed at my head, was being over there and getting caught up in riots. It was the first time I'd had a machete held at my neck. At one point, we were in the capital city getting documents taken care of. The students started burning tires and throwing tires and creating these mass riots. So I had to jump in the back of a pickup truck to flee to get out of the city. I had no idea how my life was being changed in, in the moment of what was going on there. It was, it, it was so difficult. I was so scared all the time, um, scared for my safety, afraid that the adoption would fall apart, like all of those pieces that happened that stayed with me pretty much that whole time so being there being a, a white american dude in haiti gonna adopt a little haitian girl a little black skin girl brown skin girl like were there any like what what are their cultural challenges or were there cultural challenges like how did that play out well uh, during this period i think one of the major things that i wrestled with myself was uh, asking myself what's my motive like do I have a savior mentality? Uh, am I this white dude that's going to go in and, and rescue and make something happen? Or you know, what, what's here? Like, what's driving um, this? I, I did learn a lot about Haitian culture in that they're so relaxed about life. And I was so uptight uh, about life. And, you know, they would say lunch at 12. And that could be anywhere from 12 to 1. Like, it just didn't really matter. And, you know, no one got stressed over things like that. Um, I, I watched the, the beauty of relationships in Haiti. And so, you know, for example, the, the, the mission where I stayed and with, with the attorney as well, um, they had this pickup truck and the back of it was set up with some uh, some like risers so more people could like join in the back of the pickup truck. And we'd leave to go to the city 
And it's just like two of us in there. But by the time we got to the city, the truck was full of people. We get the little stop signs and they're like, hey, where are you going? You want to ride? Jump on board. It was like, it was just so much love and, and companionship for, for people, taking care of people, looking out for them. And um, a whole lot less stressful than my mind uh, created for myself. Yeah. I think that's a, a, a nice little nugget you threw in there that your mind created for yourself versus it being an stress being something that's externally given to us is yeah. something that we we give to ourselves based on whatever variables happen right now how about when you came back to the states how, what what's that so six and a half months this process it stressful um how was that that racial component for you because that's new to you a comfortable small town religious um upbringing now all of a sudden you have a, a dark-skinned baby in north carolina like what yes well the beauty is at that point i had moved to the capital city so i was in the raleigh okay. area which is an extremely diverse inclusive type high population um and i've asked her like what she has experienced from her side she's never really articulated anything i can say that i i have never faced anything which is very surprising to me um for her i, I think she was about three years old and uh, i walked into the kitchen one day and she was sitting on the floor and she was playing with her toys and she was putting them into groups and her name is nina and i asked her like nina you know what are you doing and she looked at me, looked at me, and she said, Dad, I'm making families. She said, they don't match, but they're still family, just like I don't match, but I'm family. Mm. And at a very early age, I had this hope that she would understand that the color of my skin or the color of her skin, it's, it just didn't matter to us that, that we're family and that, that we're one, and the blood may not be the same, but we're here by choice and by decision, and we're there for each other, and this is family for us. That's powerful. That's, like, That's cool. It. Cool, a cool story. story yeah how did you get to like this kind of goes back to a little bit of the beginning and the work that you've done to be true to who you are be authentic and how how did you get to a space of being so comfortable with that right because like i i think about your dad and the way he raised you probably would have handled it differently <laughs> right um so like how did you get to that space i just out of curiosity I think time, I think reading, I think being exposed to the way that other people behave, the way that other people operate. I think it's a combination of all that. And then, you know, going back to my true self is not, you know, like, like when it comes to my kids, like I'm not the type of parent that wants to control my kids. Like what I want to do is find out what's in them. And I just really want to understand who she is and who my other kids are. Like what's inside of you? And then how can I help support you? Go out there and do what it is that, that you want to do that will make you happy. You know, the other thing I think I heard earlier, especially when you were talking about authenticity, it seems like, you know, to answer your question, Keith, I think it's like you don't seem um, threatened by like her learning about her family or her wanting to try coding. Like you may not be a coder. You're not Haitian, but that's cool. Like, let's learn about it. Or like you want you're interested in it so you can allow her that because you've done the work on yourself to say like, these aren't threats to me. These are opportunities for her. Absolutely. I think like, you know, meeting her biological grandmother, for example, that just means one more family member to me or meeting her biological uncle. That's just another person to come to Thanksgiving. Like what? There's nothing to be threatened over. Like the table just getting bigger. And I'm much more of the type of person that's, you know, let's just add some more chairs around the table. Like the more people, the merrier in, in all of this. That's awesome. So, um, that Oh, well, Keith, you had mentioned earlier um, her, Nina, being kind of the the start of this journey on persuasive conversation. That's exactly yeah. what I was going to ask. <laughs> Mind <laughs> meld. We're on the same page, yeah, bro. It's been, um, it's good. How, so was it in the process where you started to have to be persuasive in order to make it happen? Or how did that, how did this journey start for the persuasive conversation side? And, and in know, that, too. and in that, what is persuasive communication? Oh, and maybe All right. we'll start there, yeah. We're going for it, aren't we? Yeah, all right. we're going <laughs> to go for it. We're going to go right. all in. Well, here we go. So one day, much to my surprise, I received an email from my Haitian attorney that said, Jeff, the government shut down. 
We don't know what's going to happen to the government. We don't know when it's going to reopen. We don't know if your files will still be available. We don't know what's happening right now. So, Jeff, at best, you need to consider your adoption on hold. At worst, Jeff, you may need to accept the fact that your adoption is over and this is never going to move forward. Well, I had been there three or four times at that point. Like I had held her. I had kissed her cheek. I was in love. Like I was at that point of no return. Like we got to make this thing happen. Like the government's shutting down. I, I can go. Th- I can take that on. Like I'll go over. I can fix it. I'll fix anything. I'll go over. So the first night, you know, I admit I was deflated. You know, I was devastated. You can imagine you know, what was happening in my head. This wasn't. This was no longer adopting a baby from Haiti. This was my daughter is in Haiti. And I need to get her here. So that was a mindset shift. When I Once I reached that point of no return, it was, she's my daughter. I, this has to be done. I'm not leaving my daughter here. Um, she had become extremely ill. Um, I didn't even recognize her one of the trips because she had lost so much weight um, during that period of time. But you know, I got this email. I was devastated. You know, I, I went to, to bed just totally defeated. I uh, woke up the next morning, and this was my plan. I was going to fly to Haiti. I was going to stay with my attorney. And every single day, I was going to walk with my translator to that government office in hopes that someone would just randomly pop in to that office. And then maybe I could get the signature and so I could keep this thing going. So every morning, I was optimistic. You know, the sun comes up in Haiti. When the sun comes up and the roosters start crowing, everybody's up. Like, the city's alive. So I was up every morning out there. I, I, let's, let's do this. Today's the day. Somebody's going to show up. I'm going to get this signed. Um, only to walk home at the end of the day without a signature and without, no, without any advancement whatsoever. Until finally one day. The government official that I needed to sign the document happened to pop in the office just for a few minutes, spontaneously popping in there. And so I went in to have a conversation with him. And my conversation went something like this, like, I need you to sign this document. My adoption is on hold. I can't finish this with my daughter. You need to sign this now. I've got to get out of here. I've got to get back to my kids in the USA. I need you to do this right now. Mm, I hear well, this, it. Yeah. this guy looked at me and said, no. <laughs> and he wasn't going to do it. And so, like, I'm like, like trying to regroup at this point. Like, I'm thinking, what am I going to do in this moment? So, you know, quickly, I was having to like refocus my mind here to figure out what I what, what I could do. How do I how do I pull this thing back around? Because you know, again, especially with with this weakness of, of seeking other people's approval, like I just had to get this done. Because that's that's how people praise me. Like, if, if I could get this done, so you know, I had a few moments there, and I drew on my limited knowledge of Haitian culture, but I, I did have some some understanding of the culture. And here's what I did know. I knew that Haitians loved their children. They were they valued their children, and babies were like jewels to them. So I turned the conversation around, and instead of talking about I, me, and my, I turned it around. I said, "Look, I know you care about Haitian children. I know that you, you know, that you value them. Here's this girl. Here's her story. You know, I know that you would want the very best for her. I'll provide a home. I'll provide love for her. I'll provide an education for her if you'll sign this document." In ten minutes, the document was signed, and I was out the door. So I started walking back to the house, wondering, like, trying to understand, like, what happened? What was this experience? How did I go from no to yes in this conversation? And here, it wasn't like an epiphany. Like, there was no stars from heaven coming down, and like my whole world changed. It, it wasn't. It That's was the, the be- thing about epiphanies too. Like, I think it's because we watch movies. Like, we expect <laughs> it to be. You know, this crescendo moment, the music's playing, there's a birds around, it's or or just like I get my superpowers and I feel it. But it's usually just a thought. It is. That's exactly what it was. It was this first understanding that this whole thing about I, me, and my didn't work. But talking about him and what mattered to him did work. So combining that with my communications background, you know, began this understanding, this journey of understanding persuasive communication. Um, and for me, looking at persuasion versus manipulation and often the pushback that I get when I talk to people about, you know, about what I do is they, you know, like, Oh, Jeff, you teach people how to manipulate for a living. And oftentimes we think manipulation and persuasion are kind of all the same thing. And it's, it's really not our fault. We've been through a lot of sales training where they told us we're persuading, but they're giving us these little key phrases that we can use and to, to, to really to manipulate the other people. So here's, here's how, here's how I define it is this, that manipulation means this, it means to control or to influence a person or a situation. 
but to do it unfairly. Now, like persuasion, manipulation is moving people. It is getting them to go to a different place, but we're doing it out of our own self-interest, and we're doing it for our own good. We probably all know what that feels like if we have joined a gym and we've gone to that first free training experience where the trainer then- Hey, I used to sell gym memberships. (laughs) Uh, There we go. (laughs) He was that guy. (laughs) <laughs> or, you know, buying like, buying a car and you know, going through that, that whole experience. Now, l- contrast that with persuasion. And persuasion is this. Persuasion means to call someone to do something. But we're do- doing it through reasoning or we're doing it through sound argument. And the argument here, this isn't like what we do at Thanksgiving and Christmas, talking about politics and religion. It's really this understanding of people like openly talking about what's important to them, where the gaps are, what it is they're wanting, what they're looking for, what their values are. And then, especially over a sustained period of time, sustained effort, that what ends up happening then is the other person comes and we're in the very same place. Now, I look for two magical words. If I'm having a contract negotiation for my my company or for speaking, to know if I'm manipulated or I persuaded. And these two magic words will always tell you the difference. And those two magic words are, that's right. Here's what I mean by that. When I finish a negotiation with a client, they look at me and they say, Jeff, that's right. Your company can solve this problem for us. Your company is a solution that, that we need. Or the, the meeting planner says, hey, Jeff, that's right. You are the right person to be on stage for this client. You can fix it. You can bring a solution to the table. What I know in that moment is that person, my audience, wants this just as much as I want it. And they want it for themselves. They see the good for them. They see their own benefit and how their life will be better through this. And so they want it just as much. And that point, I know that I persuaded. And to me, persuasion is about leadership. It's about seeing a future. It's about seeing a better path, a new way that life could be, and bringing people alongside of that, but making sure that we're doing it in their own self-interest and not our own. There are times where it's a long game, and there are times where we need something to happen right now. And both are persuasive situations that when you're when you come into a conversation a dialogue with intent this is kind of along the lines of our mission with intent to change someone's mind you're essentially going into it with a selfish intent you need to think the way i think versus creating a space that and i kind of want to ask about this too that gives you the opportunity to persuade somebody um, that the ideas that you think may be something you want to adopt because they may give you space to do something better. But at the same time, then I ask the question, do you see it also as important, um, especially in the long game, when there's not something concrete, like I need to sign a contract or I need I need you to sign this piece of paper so I can um, you know, take my child home, right? Very concrete. But in the in the longer game where where it's really more thought provoking, do you see it just as important to go into that situation open to be persuaded and um, and creating a, a sense of patience, knowing that you may not necessarily persuade someone in that moment? It may take time. Love the question. question. Okay. Yes. No, I love the question. Buried in one of my chapters, um, the chapter is called um, Positioning Your Message So People Say Yes. Buried in that chapter is this concept of binary versus non-binary options. It happens in that moment. And oftentimes, if we're open to non-binary options, the end product may not be exactly what I thought it was going to be. Like the, whole, the whole thing may end up being a little bit different, but it's something that I can work with, and it's something that the other person can, can work with as, as well. So like, I spent a whole chapter in the book talking about helping others find their win, so you win. Like, I had to help that Haitian government official find his win which was taking care of something that was extremely important to him as an individual. And it was only because I helped him find his win that I was able to find my win in that moment. This was born out of 15 years of debate on religion and uh, gay rights and all these things that we had very discreet, different points of view on. And we just talk to each other like out of respect and love. And then eventually it was like, Oh, you know what? I I see where you're coming from. 
we came to that same place. Whether we agree or not, we were still standing in the same and we space both with moved the same ideas. From our initial yeah. rocks, right? Like, yeah. It, I, there's one thing, like kind of going back to this perspective, like coming into a conversation or the pushback that you get around persuasion, persuasion being manipulation is this this thought that I struggle with. And I, I'd love to get your take on it is in what you're saying, persuasion requires the other party to be in a place that they can be persuaded. In other words, let's use a binary choice, right? If I'm, we're, we're, we're all in sales, so it's an easy one for us in this room. Maybe not everybody will understand it, but if I'm out to sell a product, my, my, my customer, ultimately, if I'm going to persuade them, needs that product, right? If at, through the act of listening, the act of discovery, the act of all of those things, it's understood that, yeah, what I'm offering is not something that they need. Thus, I will not persuade them that they'll need it. I'll probably persuade them that they won't. Is that just as important? Because even though you're not necessarily getting what you want out of it, you are taking that perspective of what they need. And then maybe you cut your ties and move on. Like, what's your take on that? Because that's that's kind of a, a point in the murkiness of manipulation versus persuasion, right? Manipulation yes. tell us to keep going, right? Yes. And I wanted to I wanted to devote a chapter in this. My publisher didn't want me to, but I wanted to to devote a chapter. Basically, so you know, what do you do when the other person says no? And I wanted to have that conversation, which is, uh, which is exactly what you're asking here. I, in my experience, maybe that's the next I, book. Maybe that's the next book. <laughs> so, um, in my experience, finding that peace when the other person says no, or allowing, like, if the universe isn't going to align all of this, to be at peace with that, because sometimes in my life, maybe I have manipulated and forced things to happen. And then when I get it, I get you know, the what happened. I'm like, oh, my God, this is not what I wanted in life whatsoever. So having this let it be mentality of, hey, you know, I'm going to listen to you. Here, here's how I think this could work. If it's not going to work, I would rather know this right now. We live in a time <clears throat> of uh, these online God, relationships. Yeah. Specific, I'm thinking specifically of Facebook. And I cannot... There's been so many scenarios I've seen friends and family members, you know, the, the big thing now is defriending, right? Like, yeah, I'm cutting you out. You said something I don't like. And don't damage the relationship over the thing. Like, people are important. People, relationships are important. It's like, man, you may not like their views on Hillary or on Trump. But people are important. Like, like we can talk or we or not talk about it. But it's like... How, like, how do we, how do, how do you help people get to that space where you're in the midst of it? You're in the negotiation. Your sales manager's there, so it's closing time, right? And you're like, <laughs> I want this car. You're emotionally committed. I like driving this coupe. Yet you're like, you know what? Uh, this isn't the one. You're like, you know, we'll we'll talk next time or next time I I see a car here I like. I and that very much speaks to the to to the the concepts of politics, religion, sexual orientation, whatever the case may be, the non-binary. Like, it's one thing to get, you know, okay, if you damage the relationship with the car dealership, I'm with you, don't do it. But if you do, it's not going to be the end of the, the end of the world. But if it's your sister and it's politics and it's a non-binary persuasive situation, like how do you help people navigate that like what what what's the space on the non-binary because that's probably the hardest thing to navigate right part of this i think like to go back like to really dig down in a little bit deeper in, in what you're saying here um it's it, i think it comes from a, a unwillingness to just really listen and accept other people where they are and realize you know they're not there because they're horrible people that they're just mean people but that's that's where they are and you know I, I learned that during this this election this past election time where you know I I grew up in rural North Carolina uh, which can be extremely conservative and you know here I, I'm in the capital city I've, I've got this diverse inclusive family and so you know we lean a little bit more to the left in the political work we, we lean to the left but but going back home over some of the holidays and listening to people 
you know, what I began to understand was their story was very real to them. And the pain that they were experiencing was very real to them. They were concerned about jobs leaving the city. They were concerned about, you know, about the upward mobility. They were concerned about their, their young people that are leaving and going to cities because they can't support themselves in the smaller community anymore. So the pain that they were feeling was extremely real to them. And sure, they may have viewed someone could fix that pain that I didn't agree with could fix it. But it wasn't a bad, they're not bad people because they're experiencing that pain or they have those, those concerns. And I don't have to change their mind. I don't have to agree with them. But I can still love them and realize there is a reason that they think the way that they think and that they feel the way that they feel. And it doesn't mean they're a bad person. To your, I think you nailed this, this know point of ex, know the people and accept, not just know where they are, accept where they are. Um, it's such a powerful cultural statement whether you're on the right looking at the left or on the left looking at the right accepting someone where they are allows you to openly listen to them and ultimately create a space for dialogue yeah. and that dialogue may be persuasive at the end of the day to a common place where you both come into the middle versus being so far on the outs there's this question I have, because this is something I personally struggle with, is when you're in a situation, um, especially political, and someone says something that creates that visceral emotional reaction, like, really? You know, and it, and it automatically creates that barrier to not accept them where they are. Um, how do you guide, coach, teach people to be in that because that i think to me is one of the hardest spaces all this other stuff is awesome functional stuff but if you can't get past or even to that space of accepting to someone where they are like then nothing else is possible like how do you help people do that like what what are your words of wisdom on that aside from read my book <laughs> <laughs> buy my book and we discuss it um one of the things that, that we do in public affairs working with elected officials and it's the same thing that happens when we're, we're dealing with um with issues like this of persuasion is making sure that we don't box people in to state their opinion too soon because what can end up happening so if, if we have an elected official that's undecided like i don't want to force you and get in your face and make you make a decision immediately because there's a 50 50 chance that you're going to go with the other person and the thing is once you've staked out your ground in a situation like that it's really hard to retreat hard to so how do we it is like because you've that you've got pride you've got ego on the line with all of this so when it comes to, to it Exactly. That's so hard to change. So making sure that we don't get to the ask too soon. And as I said in, in the book, like, like playing this thing out, like fully understanding where the person is and not making the ask too soon. Sometimes that visceral feeling that we have, yes, we have to breathe. Like the first thing I have to do is I have to breathe. But is there something I can do to keep us from even getting to that point? So instead of playing defense to that and now having to breathe and pull myself by the other, did I push you too hard? Did I push you too fast in this decision making? How can I change my approach in working with you so I can lessen the likelihood that that will happen? And oftentimes that comes when we, we go in too hard for that fast decision, that immediate yes, no for them. Um, and that oftentimes is what creates that, that monster where give it some time. Um, you know, as I talked about the, in the definition, sustained effort. This isn't about happening just like this instantaneously. It's a sustained effort over time uh, with the other person. I don't know if we shared this with you, but the way we got to this process of talking to somebody about their background and getting to know who they are a little bit before we started getting into like what they're doing or issues that they care about is exactly that. Like we wanted to give time to understand the person that we're talking to before we get into what they think or why or yeah, what they think. And I, it's just, um, we kind of and we've actually had to defend it because some people are like your podcast is too long or like why don't you just get to it just get to what they think it's like well but if we do that then you might just hate them like <laughs> like, <laughs> like like in real life com conversations aren't we asked about life hacks earlier conversations aren't a life hack like you can't just get to the meat and not take some time to get to know the person 
So, I, so I'm curious. Yeah, do you have a a good like thinking in the non-binary, right? Because that's a lot of the space that we are in, right? That we focus oh. on. Um, so focusing, like, do you have a let? Let's take an example, because I think examples are great teaching tools. If I'm sitting at the Thanksgiving table, and my relative sits up and goes, they need to get that damn wall built. Like that's the statement. That's the claim. Now me, I don't, I don't fall when it comes to immigration. I don't fall on the spectrum of build the wall. Um, I will stake a claim in that position. But my, all of a sudden, my, my response tightens up and then I want to, what are you talking about? I want to yell. Right. Because now the, the 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 position's been boxed. How how would you handle that situation to actually create a space of long term persuasion one way or another, even if you ultimately want to be persuaded that the wall's a good idea? Right. Like, how would you manage that without boxing that conversation into such a binary conversation? Yeah, so probably one of the things that I would do is to ask, you know, why do you feel this way? What is the threat? And hearing what their concerns are, um, and because it, it might be that another another solution can meet that instead of just a wall, and they they only know one avenue. They only know wall or no wall. That's that's all that they know. What 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 concerns you? Like, and and, and I talk you know in the book about like like this whole process of um, you know. Helping other find the winner. I talk through steps of listening, where we first of all, like, like we listen, right? We, it's not about us saying no, we don't need a, a, a wall. Here's why, blah 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 blah. The, the person is already in their place. Like you're not going to just change them just because you say no, we don't need a wall. Like they, they've already heard that. That's not that's not going to work there. But but listen is is the first step in all of this. And then the second thing is to ask questions, and to ask clarifying questions, not yes or no. Do you think we need to build a wall? Yes or no? No, that's not the type of question. Well, why do you think we need to build a wall? What problem does this solve? What does that fix? And like begin to like drill in like what's really happening inside of that person? Are they afraid? Are they concerned about their job? Are, are they concerned about the safety? Like what's really going on inside of the person? And then helping them discover others. But it, it, it comes to this this process of listening, asking questions, and then asking clarifying questions because sometimes especially if we're in relationships with, with people like our spouse, we may have this conversation, if you will, with our spouse uh, that gets a little heated and like, you know, and we, and we, we walk out of that. Never. <laughs> that only happens to me. Um, and, and we walk out of that and we're like, all right, I got my marching orders. I'm going to do one, two and three. I'm going to change this. And this whole scenario is going to be better. And we go down this path and our spouse looks at us like, that's not what I was saying at all. Why are you going all the way uh, yeah. down and doing that? Yeah. That's not what I want from you. That's, that's not <laughs> what I was saying. And so we kind of have this you know, misalignment in there. Mm -hmm. So asking this cl clarifying questions, are you saying this? Are you saying that you think a wall will do this? Asking the clarifying questions in hopes that both of you will find you know new territory um, and all that. And then what we're looking for is like, we know what it is we want. We ask questions, we ask clarifying questions. And then the Venn diagram, that sweet spot is the alignment. That's the area where we can move together forward. So you know we might be in a, in a cable in a case like this. And keep in mind, like, some people aren't going to change. Like, some people are totally. hardcore in their position. It's not going to change. Um, and in cases like that, I do just let it be and walk away. It's like, why bother? Like, if this well, it's like you said, not, accepting people where they are. Like, just accept it. If, if, yeah. I, if, if it's not a situation where we can have a good, intelligent conversation and be willing at the end to walk away on opposite sides, but still with our arm around each other, then, then why bother? Like, just let it be. Great. Have your wall. Could you pass the yeah. turkey and the green? Right, exactly. Well? <laughs> well, that's the other thing I was thinking of. Could I was like, well, if, if you get that response, it's kind of like, well, why am I upset that they said that? Like, it, like okay. Cool. Now, now, would now would you argue <clears throat> that it to be careful in the questions that you ask, such that you're not interrogating to lead them towards a place that you believe, uh, but actually asking questions out of curiosity versus trying to steer the agenda. So, or would you section, say both? 
No, I, I, so this section of like with these three steps of you know listen, ask questions, clarifying questions, seek alignment. That chapter is that, that information is under the chapter about helping others find their win, and in that, that's what we're looking for. Like we want to hear from them. Like it matters what they're thinking. That's where we can begin the process of finding an alignment and find a way of of persuading through leadership. We have to be able to hear that. So it, it isn't just about you know listening to rebuttal them. It's listening to understand. So it goes back to our heart, our intention, our motivation. Why are you listening? Are you listening so you can get your next point? You know, we've got to build this wall because of the caravan. And I go, oh, well, let me tell you about that caravan. We haven't talked about that caravan since the election, have we? Oh, it was wrong. Like, that's, that's not what we're after. Like, we, we're really understanding with the heart of where are they because we, we care about them. And like, I constantly want to get the other person into the conversation. Mm -hmm. People will tell you everything you want to know if you'll just stop long enough to listen. Do you Do ever you? have to take a break? Yes. There's or... nothing wrong with space. I love space. Like sometimes if I'm if I'm in a place where I just can't continue the conversation, you know, I'll say things and I'll be just it, like, hey, look, I want to continue this conversation. I'm not just dropping this, but I need a little bit of space so I can pull myself back together and and let's let's approach this again. Can we talk tomorrow or can we talk in a, in a few days and I'll get back with you? Now, we, what we don't want to do is drop it and make mm -hmm. the person feel like we don't care about them and not pick the conversation back up. But that was one of the best lessons I learned through my therapist was it's okay to ask for space. Sometimes space is exactly what we need to realign ourselves, to get ourselves back to the place where we want to be. My kids to understand like at night when I'm tired don't ask me anything don't ask me any questions because I'm going to be grumpy I'm going to be ill and I'll have to say look guys I'm sorry let me get some sleep and we'll pick, can we pick this conversation up in the morning and I'll talk to you in the morning and that's just the space that I need in that as well but there's beauty in space in this concept of asking questions right what's the 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 art like, because I, I find there's an art in asking questions, right? If someone, let's take the Thanksgiving example, and you ask the question, oh, why why do you think that? That first question may seem um, innocent enough, give them space to answer and listen. As a curious person myself, I like to then ask another question or then I, it can reach a point where the other person just feels like they're being interrogated when your intent is not necessarily to interrogate it's to understand but they're not in that space like how do you navigate that because i think that isn't that's a that's a breakdown right that that can easily happen depending on how receptive the other person is to receiving receiving your questions yeah so part of that i think is like helping to reassure them what our motive is and what our uh, you know, what we're after, why we're asking these questions, because it can go, especially if it gets like back and forth, like too rapid fire, it can feel that, that way, like you're interrogating. Mm -hmm. One of the best things I think you can do to stop that feeling uh, of this interrogation is to validate something that they've said. Slow it down, slow down the conversation, find some point of agreement in that conversation, acknowledge, and even if you don't agree, acknowledge and validate what it is they're saying. And, and making sure that they, even if you differ on that, you can still acknowledge them and validate, ah, I, can, I can understand why that would be important to you. It may not be important to you, but it might be important to that person. And, and acknowledging that will keep you from them from feeling that you're just, you know, the police force coming at them. Um, well, Jeff, as always the case, the time seems to be all proving uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, time is, is all, all in your perspective, right? And yes. um, it has gone by very, very quickly. Uh, so we're, we're coming up on time. And, you know, as we, as we always like to ask our guests at the end. Um, so, yeah, we're all, about, we're all about this process of exposing, evaluating, and evolving. And I would like to ask you, like how how would you challenge our listeners to evolve their thought processes and evolve like what would you, what kind of thoughts would you leave them with to to challenge them to uh, to evolve? Let me leave with this. Um, I wrapped up the adoption. I'm in the Miami airport. I'm holding my daughter now, looking down at her, and for a brief moment of time. I'm feeling pretty proud. Like I feel like I accomplished this. You know, I got my arm around patting myself on the back and uh, feeling really good about, about what I did. And just as quickly as that came in the window, it went out the window. 
And I started to wonder about her. So I looked down at her and I began to wonder what she's going to be when she grows up. Is she going to be a doctor and heal the sick? Would she be a humanitarian and relieve suffering? Would she be a teacher that could impact hundreds of students that then could go impact thousands of lives? And while I couldn't answer any of those questions, here's what I did know. This adoption wasn't just over. Like I stood there thinking this is completed, six and a half months, it's finished, it's done, it's over. It, it wasn't over. Like This is just the beginning. It's kind of like we've probably all been to a lake or pond and picked up a stone and tossed it in. And we know that what happens after that is ripples continue to, to, to go out. So my understanding of that moment was this wasn't over. That now, because of what I've done, the steps that I've taken, following my passion, learning how to persuade, getting her here, that now this whole thing is starting brand new. And she's going to reach out and touch so many more people than I will ever even know or will ever have any relationship with these people. And oftentimes in life, our heads get down. Like We were so concerned about the emails we have to return or the meetings we have to have or the podcast that we have to record, and we lose track of the fact here that this is so much bigger than any any of this. I mean, as we create, for those who have companies, as we create jobs, right, we're bringing new people in. We're taking people that didn't have a job, and we're giving them a job, which means that their kid, if their kid needs tutoring, for example, the kid can go get the tutoring that they need, which can impact the grades, which can impact the college that they go to, which can impact the person that they meet in their life, which can impact the career that they end up having and the lives that they touch. And it's so easy to just get down to the day-to-day stuff. But the things that we're doing, if we look at this through the, the lens of the greater good, it's extremely motivational. It inspires me every single day to get up and to talk more, continue to have these conversations, and help people see a different life for themselves because it's so much bigger than just them. 